Let's turn to Luke 16 with me, please. Verse 19. I've got to preach this or I have no peace. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass the beggar died and was and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Father, in thy holy name, bless thy blessed word to the hearing of the people. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. I'm happy this morning, Lord, to be a messenger. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. They will not be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I read in my Bible where on the third day our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and ascended 40 days later to the right hand of the Father. It is seated in heaven now, finishing, has finished the work, and is coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. You'd be amazed at how the spin is put on Luke chapter number 16 by most of the religions today. They say, well, this is a parable, preacher. All right, so it's a parable. I don't believe that. I believe this man actually lived. But let's say it's a parable. All right. What's the fire? What's the point? What's the message? And you'll spend that any way you please. But the bottom line is that this man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now, if this was the only mention of hell in the Bible, you might say, well, you know, that goes back to their culture 2,000 years ago. Boy, it's not the only mention. The Bible says much about it beforehand and much about it after Luke chapter number 16. Oh, no, 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 no. This is not an isolated case in the Bible where hell is mentioned. But when it is mentioned here, it is mentioned in graphic terms. It leaves nothing to the imagination. It tells you plainly that he died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and he said, I'm in torment. I'm suffering in this flame. Now, if he'd only said I'm suffering, then you might say, well, he was suffering mentally. But the scripture says that he was in a flame. The flame, therefore, is representative of a burning hell, a place where you don't want to go. For example, my friend, Luke chapter number 16, these churches make light of it. And my, I'll tell you what. I have a problem because the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who gave you Luke chapter number 16. If you have a red letter Bible, everything I read to you is in red. This is the Lord Jesus Christ talking. As a matter of fact, if you've read your New Testament, especially the Sermon on the Mount, you discover very quickly that the Lord Jesus Christ preached more about hell than anybody else that ever lived on this earth. We can't find where Paul mentions hell as much as Christ. We can't fi find where Peter or any of the rest of them talk about hell as much as he did. The Lord Jesus Christ makes it very clear and very plain that hell is a real place. It's a place that you don't want to go to. It's mentioned in the Bible because it's there for a warning. The Word of God is written to tell you what's going to happen when you die. When you leave this world, what lies beyond the grave? What's on the other side? What's in that 
dark, dark area that nobody can explain. You stand up, you say to me, preacher, I don't believe in hell. What do you base that on? Your feelings? Well, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not going to base my eternity on how you feel. Somebody can come to me and honest preacher, there is no hell. Tell me something, dear friend. How did you discover that? Have you been over there? If you're living a godless life and you're an atheist or an agnostic, Christ rejecter, you can be certain of this. The day will come when you will discover firsthand that there is a hell. And when that day comes, there's nothing you can do about it because you're going to be there. You're going to leave this world without God and without Christ and you go to hell. What do you think the cross is for? Why do you think we preach the blood? Why were we singing about Calvary this morning? Why were we singing about being saved? Because, my friend, that there is a place that you don't want to go to. People live like there is no judgment. They live like there is no hereafter. They live like they'll never give an account for their sins. They murder today like it's nothing. I have never seen in my life as many murderers walking around as we have today. They just blow each other away like it's no big deal. But the Bible says the murderer will have his place in hell. We've come to a point in our culture and our society where we are amoral, not immoral. Immoral is an individual that knows there's a morality. An amoral individual says there is no morality. I live as I please like a dog, and that's exactly the way people are living. So this message this morning is directed towards somebody. It burdened my soul. It bothered me. It's been bothering me for days now. And when God does this, he's got it for somebody in here. I'm going to read something for you in just a few minutes and I want you to listen very carefully to what I read because it's very, very, very important. Years ago, I had a cardiologist come to this church and his name was Maurice Rawlings. I met him firsthand. Very smart man. This man was dedicated to God. Something had happened to this doctor that literally changed his life. I didn't know at the time what a cardiologist was. Had no idea, but in the last few years, I found out firsthand what a cardiologist does. Believe me, I know what they do. But at that time, about 30, 35 years ago, it's been a long time. Dr. Rawlings came here and he brought his wife with him. He got up here and he told about some of his experiences. He told Temple Baptist Church what he had experienced firsthand. Now, folks, I hope that you'll listen to this man. I hope that you haven't been brainwashed to the point to where you don't pay any attention. You think, well, only stupid people believe the Bible. Folks, this is a brilliant man. He at one time was the doctor to Dwight David Eisenhower. He was his doctor. He had many awards handed to him. And his son right now, he's an oncologist. No, there you can't attack the credentials of Maurice Rawlings. But what I would like for you to do is to listen to his very words as he tells you what happened one day when he had a man on a treadmill. Now, I've been on a treadmill, but mine was done with medication. It was a stress test on my heart. And I felt as if I'd been climbing a mountain and I was lying flat on my back on a, on a bed. But the same effect took place when that nurse gave me that medication to give me a, to give me a, to put stress on my heart. That way the doctor can determine how it's pumping and other things that he wants to know. So he has this man on a treadmill. And this man had been having chest pains. And so this man is walking on a treadmill and listen to the good doctor as he tells you what happened. Dr. Rawlings was an extremely accomplished man and a self-professed atheist. That is, until he had very unusual experience with a patient who complained of chest pains and by direction of Dr. Rawlings underwent a cardiovascular stress test. While going through this stress test, which requires the patient walk, jog, and then run on a treadmill while the doctor records the rhythm of the heartbeat, Rawlings recalled the patient had a cardiac arrest and dropped dead right in his office. As Dr. Rawlings described it, instead of fibrillating, that's where the heart twitches without a beat, the heart just plain stopped. He crumpled to the floor, lifeless. As the body was going through a series of scattered muscle twitching and convulsions, his body was gradually turning blue. As this happened, Dr. Rawlings began another procedure. He found the man's heart was completely blocked. Trying to bring the patient back to life, Dr. Rawlings attempted to install a pacemaker. After working with trying to install the pacemaker and nurses around the patient doing all they can to help Dr. Rawlings revive him, Rawlings recalls that the patient began coming to, and amidst this, this happened. 
According to Rawlings, whenever I would reach for instruments or otherwise interrupt my compression of his chest, the patient would again lose consciousness, roll his eyes upward, arch his back in mild convulsion, stop breathing, and die once more. So what makes this experience more different than any he had ever had before? He explains. Each time he regained heartbeat and respiration, the patient screamed, I'm in hell! He was terrified and pleaded with me to help him. I was scared to death. In fact, this episode literally scared the blank out of me. It terrified me enough to write this book. He then issued a very strange plea. Don't stop, you see. The first thing most patients I resuscitate tell me as soon as they recover consciousness is, take your hands off my chest. You're hurting me. The doctor says I am big and my method of external heart massage sometimes fractures ribs. But this patient was telling me, don't stop. Rawlings continues on with his experience saying, then I noticed a genuinely alarmed look on his face. He had a terrified look worse than the expression seen in death. This patient had a grotesque grimace expressing sheer horror. His pupils were dilated and he was perspiring and trembling. He looked as if his hair was on end. Then still another strange thing happened. He said, don't you understand, doctor? I am in hell. Each time you quit, I go back to hell. Don't let me go back to hell. Rawlings began being irritated by this man's behavior. He recounts that I dismissed his complaint and told him to keep his hell to himself. I remember telling him, I'm busy. Don't bother me about your hell until I finish getting this pacemaker into place. Rawlings goes on. But the man was serious, and it finally occurred to me that he was indeed in trouble. He was in a panic like I had never seen before. As a result, I started working feverishly and rapidly. But this time the patient had experienced three or four episodes of complete unconsciousness and clinical death from cessation of both heartbeat and breathing. After several death episodes, he finally asked me, how do I stay out of hell? Immediately Rawlings recalled that shards of what he was taught in Sunday school many, many years ago began rushing his mind. Rawlings recounted the patient, asked Rawlings to pray for him, and Rawlings told him, what nerve? I'm a doctor, not a preacher. So the patient continued to plea for Dr. Rawlings, him, for him to pray for him. So from the back of his memory, Rawlings began praying something that sounded like this. Lord Jesus, I ask you to keep me out of hell. Forgive my sins. I turn my life over to you. If I die, I want to go to heaven. If I live, I'll be on the hook forever. It may have been a rough prayer, but it did something for the patient who did not want to return to hell. That experience prompted Rawlings to go home, dust off his Bible and read it. He wanted to know exactly what hell was supposed to be like. Amidst his researching of the Bible, Rawlings found that what he experienced scientifically was supported scripturally. Before this episode and with an atheistic frame of mind, Rawlings recorded that I had always dealt with death as a routine occurrence in my medical practice, regarding it as an extinction with no need for remorse or apprehension. But then after this episode, he said, now I was convinced there was something about this life after death business after all. All of my concepts needed revision. I needed to find out more. It was like finding another piece of the puzzle that supports the truth of the scriptures. I was discovering the Bible was not merely a history book. Every word was turning out to be true. I decided I'd better start reading it very closely. Dr. Rawlings became a Christian. This was not the end of his experiences with patients who left their bodies and went to heaven or hell and were permitted to come back with some sort of experience that occurred after the patient passed on. In addition to his practice, he began interviewing individuals from all over the world who had these experiences. Dr. Rawlings wrote many books documenting personal experiences that occurred in his office while also documenting experiences from other individuals that he'd interviewed with similar experiences. In a nutshell, Dr. Maurice Rawlings was a personality that became an unbiased gateway from the scientific to the spiritual realm, and he continued to write books. 
This was quite a remarkable man. I suggest that you get on the internet and type his name in and you'll pull up videos and you'll pull up the testimony of the people. One man in particular gives a lengthy testimony of how that he had died and he went to hell. And it was there in hell that he began to see the most grotesque things that he could ever imagine. He felt the flames of hell. He knew he was condemned. He was in the pit of hell, but he was brought back to life. It is things like that that people like to pass out of their mind and say, when I preach here, there can't be any real truth to that for God is a God of love. That's all I hear today. We're supposed to love ourselves and then appreciate the fact that God loves us because he is a God of love. Therefore, that we can live any way we please. We can live any kind of a life we want to. And there is no accountability at the end of our lives. You have believed a lie. Somebody has been messing with your mind. Now, what I'm preaching to you this morning about hell is not new. The message you're hearing from this preacher today is not new. This is what has been preached for 2,000 years. You just don't hear much of it today. And the reason you don't is because you live in the age of deception. You live in a time when men want your money. They're not interested in your soul. They don't care whether you, whether you die and go to hell or what. It doesn't matter to them one bit. And the reason they don't care whether you go to heaven or hell is because they are going to hell themselves. The pulpits in America are full of wolves in sheep's clothing that do not care for your soul. If a preacher will get up and preach to you like I am this morning, he will warn you, he will tell you that my friend, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. He will tell you the truth about where you are going to go when you leave this world. I remember when I was a boy, I used to think about eternity. I used to sit around and think about forever and ever and ever. And it would always blow my mind. I always try to get something worked out and to figure where it's coming from and where it's going and to analyze it and break it down. But I could never get a hold of eternity. And I still cannot get a hold of eternity. It is beyond human comprehension. But to think that if you die without God and without the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're going to go off into eternity lost without God. Put yourself on that treadmill. What if it was you that were taking your last breath on this earth? What if you were leaving planet earth and you were about to die? My dear friend, you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You have no idea. And yet we live like we're going to live forever. It is this false sense of security that Satan has brainwashed men and women with that causes them not to think about their eternal soul. To die without the Lord Jesus Christ is a horrible, horrible thing. The Word of God says this. Here's what it says in the book of Luke, chapter number 12 and verse number 4. But I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Listen to the Lord Jesus. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. A healthy fear of God will keep you out of a lot of trouble. A healthy fear of God will get your theology right. A healthy fear of God will change the way you live. A healthy fear of God will give you a right perspective toward the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we hear the pulpits in America today that, that they say the idea of fearing God is out of date. We just ought to reverence and respect Him. No, my dear friend, if you don't fear Him, you don't know Him. To know Him is to fear Him. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 29, our God is a consuming fire. I want you to think about that for a moment. A consuming fire. How easy would it be for him to cast me into hell fire? For 27 years I walked this earth and I was a candidate for hell. At any moment my heart could have stopped beating and I would have wound up in the pit. And I know I would have deserved to go there. For 27 long years I lived like a dog. I lived like a dog. I was an unsaved dog. Yet in 1990 
in 73. Glory to God. The grace of God came upon my soul. He convicted me and saved me from a devil's hell. And I know that I deserve to go to hell. But I've got the grace of God and the blood of Christ. I've got a Savior. I know I'll never go to hell because I believe in Jesus. I know he's my savior. I've trusted him to wash my sins away. A simple, a simple, a simple search in the word of God will bring up passage after passage after passage about hell. It's all over the Bible. Somebody said, well now preacher, hell is the grave. Is it really? Then my friend, what is this talking about? Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. That doesn't sound like a grave to me. Isaiah chapter number 5 and verse 14 says, Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth. You telling me the grave has enlarged itself? The Bible said it's appointed to men once to die and then the judgment. This earth has plenty of room for all the dead. Make no mistake about it, the necropolis is being filled up every day that you live. They're carrying caskets out here and they're playing taps or whatever they're doing. Somebody is dying right now while this preacher is preaching this message to you. Somebody is taking their last breath and they'll never breathe again on planet earth. It's over for them and they're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. Now men can hang all the accolades and wards on you they want to. They can brag about you to high heaven. Make, uh, make it sound like you're the greatest thing on earth. But when you go out into eternity there's just one that matters. There's only one that matters. There's just one name across that bar on the other side of Jordan. There's a name above every name and it's the name of Jesus. If you know him my friend you'll go to heaven if you don't know him you got no hope you wind up in the pit the bible says plainly over here in the book of uh, Amos chapter number 9 I want you to notice carefully Amos 9 verse 2 though thou dig into hell thence shall my hand take them uh, the other day it's been about three or four days ago I just happened upon that sounds from hell. Over there in Siberia a few years back, they were digging a deep pit down to get a hold of oil or something, and they got so deep into the ground, something happened, and the sound started coming up. They dropped a microphone down in there to hear it, and you could hear the screams and the wailing that were coming up out of that pit. Now, I tell you, friend, it was assaulted immediately. Everybody said, well, that never happened. Or they try to make fun of it. And they say, if you believe in that, you're a fool. This and that and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, I can't find anybody, my friend, that was around to prove it was wrong. I can't find anybody that can substantiate, document the fact that what happened that day was not real. They dug into the ground and these sounds started coming up out of the ground. And it's all worse thing thing you ever heard in your life to hear men and women screaming Amos says you can dig into hell that I just read to you from Amos chapter number 9 the Lord Jesus Christ said fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell I have nothing but the greatest respect for Maurice Rawlings. I do not believe for one minute that this is a fabricated thing. I believe this cardiologist had this man on that treadmill and I believe he dropped dead. It's not a game, it's not a joke, it's not a theatrics. This is the real world. I dare say, my dear friend, if you get into the medical profession and start talking to some of these doctors, you'd be amazed at what some of them will tell you that they have seen because many of these doctors are there at the very moment that the soul and spirit leaves the body. Nurses too, for the nurses are standing around the bedside and they watch what happens. Because this is 2016, we have all these medications and they can medicate someone to the point now to where they're literally just lying there and they're out of it completely until their spirit and soul leaves the body. But that's not the way it used to be. It used to be that they were conscious right on up Many times until they took their last breath. Here's one that died in 1883. 
And I give you his testimony that was recorded by a preacher. The preacher's name was Reverend C.A. Balk, Cloverville, New York. And here's what he said. In 1883, at the age of 74, this infidel left the world. And here's what he said as he was leaving. He said, I'm in the flames. Pull me out, pull me out, pull me out. I'm in the flames, he said. Pull me out. How many has ever heard of Oliver B. Green? Oliver B. Green was one of my favorites when I first got saved. I don't know how many of his messages I used to listen to all the time. And I noted when the, in the newspaper when the Lord took Brother Green home to be with him. Have great respect for Oliver Green. He, sa- he gave this story. He said when he was a little boy, there was a wicked man that lived in the town where he lived. He said that man came time for him to die, and he was laying on his deathbed. He said he rose up in bed. He'd been in a coma, apparently, or something for some time, but all of a sudden his eyes just popped open wide, and he rose up as, as far as he could in that bed, and he said, can't you see them? They're coming. They're coming down the sidewalk. Can't you see them? They're coming after me. And they said, no, there's nobody out there and tried to comfort him. Oh, yes, there he is. They're coming for me. And he's and they said to him, Oh, no, 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 you're just you're just you're just you're just hallucinating. And then he said, They're coming through the door. They're coming through the door. They're coming to get me. They're coming after me. And he screamed before he died and said, Oh, they're dragging me down to hell. I'm going to the pit. I'm burning. And Oliver Green said, those that stood by that bed that time, watched that man die, said it changed their life from then on. They never were the same again to watch a soul die and go to hell. You don't want to see that, and I don't want to see that. There are things that you just don't want to see because you'll never forget it. It'll stick with you from now on. But that's what Oliver Green said. And I remember hearing that story 45 years ago, right after I got saved, a little after 1973, about 74 or 5, I heard that story about this man dying and going to hell and screaming. Now, my dear friend, listen to me this morning. Before you walk out this door right now, your spirit and soul could leave your body. And where are you going to go when you do leave this body? I want to ask you a question. Where are you going to go? Do you know you're saved today? Do you know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you know the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed your sins away? Do you know that? Do you know that? Because if you don't know that, you're playing Russian roulette with your life. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross at Calvary, that when he hung up on that tree, there he was nailed to that cross, what you saw at Calvary was a preview of the sinner's hell. Do you know that? You're looking at a preview of the sinner's hell. What do you mean, preacher? First of all, he was condemned. He was condemned to hang on that tree, and all that go to hell are condemned. Secondly, he was, a, he, was, he was abandoned. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All that go to hell will be abandoned. Third, the Bible said he became sin for us who knew no sin. I believe when the sinner goes to hell, it'll be a sin that eats him up for eternity. It'll be a sin, breathing it in and breathing it out what he did the opportunities to be saved they'll never leave him he'll think my 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 why didn't I walk that why didn't I get saved why didn't I bow my knees before God did you know my dear friend that in hell the name of God the name of Jesus is everywhere you turn you never heard such praying in your life as you'll hear in hell prayer meetings everywhere you turn yet it's too late it's too late it's too late it's too late now why you can be why don't you do something about it while you can, why don't you get up and walk down here right now and say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. Show me what I got to do. I don't want to go to hell. I do not want to go to hell. Why don't you do that? I did it in 1973. I'd do it again in a heartbeat if I had to, to, to stay out of hell. But I know when he saved me, he gave me eternal life, and I should never perish. But if you're here this morning, you've never done that. I plead with you in the name of Jesus. Your blood won't be on my hands anymore. I've delivered my soul. I'm not guilty of your blood now. I've told you. And all of those that will hear this message later and are watching it right now over the Internet, your blood is on your head and not mine. I've told you the truth. I've preached the Word of God to you. I'm doing what I'm called to do. What's that, preacher? I'm the messenger. That's far as I go. When it comes to the salvation of your soul, that's in the hands of God. I can't save you. Don't come to me to save you. Come to the Lord Jesus. Come to him and cry out to him, and he'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Bow your head with me this morning. 
Anybody in this house, raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And I deserve hell. And I know that's where I'm going. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me? Anybody? Anybody? God bless you. There's a hand there. Anybody else? Raise your hand and say, Preacher, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go. Anybody else? Raise your hand. There's another hand. That's two hands that have gone up this morning. Don't want to go. There's another hand that's gone up this morning. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. And I'm going to hell, preacher. And I want to be saved. Anybody else raise your hand? Say, preacher Lawson, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Anybody? Father, in thy name, Lord, I've delivered my soul. I preached what you put on my heart. I gave them thy word. Now I'm free. Thank God I'm free. I no longer have that responsibility. I'm no longer accountable. And Father, I pray now that you'd move in their heart and I pray that you'd move them to the cross. I pray you'd bring them to the Lord Jesus. A simple, simple, simple way of being saved. You'd just bow to the Son of God and invite him into their heart and ask him to cleanse them from their sins and he'll save them and write their name in heaven. In thy holy name I pray, Lord, and for Jesus' sake I ask it. And your heads are still bowed, nobody looking, nobody looking around. Would any of you that raised your hand, would you like to walk down here this morning? Would you like to walk down here and we'll meet you down here in the altar? We'll meet you down here in this altar. Amen. We've got two men that have come down here this morning. Any of you men in here would like to pray with these men? We've got three men coming down here this morning. We've got three men coming down here this morning. Would any of you men come and pray with them? They don't want to go to hell oh thank God that we can pray for them and pray with them and give them the opportunity to just simply ask you in faith believing and you'll save their soul yes. anybody else come down here we'd be glad to pray with you whoever you are you're welcome Lord that's what we're here for we're not here to destroy you we're here to help you we got two young ladies right over here that have come down to pray would anybody like for you ladies like to come and meet with these young ladies right here and pray with them? They're right over here, these young ladies right here. You ladies can come over and pray with them. Pray with them. You'll find out what they're here for. Whatever it is, that's for certain they've come to the right place. They came to the Lord, not the preacher. I try my best to make it very clear. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. I don't stand between you and God. I'm just the messenger, folks. This is, too, this is too precious, too holy, too eternal, too important for me to get in the way. I'm just the messenger. Would you like to come today and talk to the Lord? You can come. You can talk to him. You can talk to him, and he'll save you. The Bible said he came to seek and save that which was lost, and by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Hallelujah for God, for, for God to taste my death. Yes, sir, preacher, he took mine. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Anybody else like to come? Would you like to come? I've done what God put on my heart to do now. I can sleep. I can rest. I've done what I can do. The messenger has done his job as a messenger. Now the Savior will do his part as the Savior. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior. Hallelujah to God. Amen. And if the man is God's messenger, he'll point you to the Son of God. Amen. Anybody else? You'd like to come on down here? Somebody will come and pray with you. Be glad to meet you right down here and open the Bible and show you how to be saved. Sometimes you may know it intellectually, but you've never really understood it in your heart how simple it is to receive Christ. You receive the Lord Jesus Christ, folks. You're believing on him. You're taking hold of him. You're embracing him. And you're saying, Lord Jesus, you're my hope. You're my only hope. I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. Save me, Jesus. Hallelujah to God. That'll get you saved. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his righteous Son who came into this world to seek and save that which was lost. He found me, and he found me in a waste howling wilderness. He found me when all had forsaken me. He found me, glory to God. 
He found me and he saved me. I received him that day. And boy, have I been so glad and thankful for it for all these years. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of us, it's of the Lord. All right, brother. Let's stand up in here this morning and let's sing. Page, page 382 in your All-American. 382.